All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. God bless the saints of God. Those that are on um, line, those that are on um, Facebook Live, God bless you. It is time for LWC midweek service, and we're excited um, for those you can uh, who are joining via conference call or um, uh, Facebook Live on our church pages. We appreciate you so very much um, for sharing with us tonight. I pray that you will be uh, thoroughly blessed and equipped through the word of God as we attempt to give you um, what thus says the Lord. And uh, God has been so good to us and we're thankful for his blessings that he has bestowed upon us another day, another week. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you all. God bless you all. Thank you so much to those that are in. Let us bow with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day. Thank you for giving me blessings, your favor, your increase, your outpour, your mercy that you've sustained us all day long. And because of your goodness towards us, we are in the land of the living. And we're so glad um, to have, so glad, God, that you blessed us with this time to share with one another. Bless us as we study your word, open our wisdom, knowledge, understanding that we may receive that which you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Wherever you're joining us from, thank you so much for sharing with us. Come on, lock in with us for the next uh, 55 minutes. Come on, lock in with us for the next 55 minutes and receive a word from the Lord that will empower, that will strengthen, and that will equip you for greater service in the kingdom of God. If you're watching on Facebook, share this, like this, love this, all that good stuff. Help us uh, to get the word out that the word of the Lord is going forth with power and authority. Uh, we had an awesome service on Sunday morning. The Lord blessed us as we preach from the subject courage to understand the times taken from First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse number 32. And uh, we learned how the Lord gave us some awesome things, awesome tools that we learned to help us navigate in the season that we're in. And one of the things the Lord said to us that we had to write down and take note of, the Lord said, do not ignore what you see in this day in which we're living in there's so many things taking place so many things going on but saints of god we should not ignore what we see god is allowing us to see what we see for a reason and so because of that we must take note of the things that are taking place in our world so that we can uh, be the saints the sons the daughters the believers that jesus christ wants us to be um and so we're excited about that and thankful that the Lord gave us such a word as that on Sunday. All right. So we're going to go back to our last Thursday night. We took a pause, a prophetic pause, if you will. The Lord led us to go to um, Psalm 3 and talk about um, my shield, my glory, the lifted up of my head. And certainly the Lord blessed us in a great way. We're going to go back to our series that we're, excuse me, talking from. Uh, as it relates to our midweek service. And uh, our series is um, um, a ministry fueled by prayer. And of course, tonight's topic is um, praying for our enemies, praying for our enemies. And um, one of the things um, that we, uh, of course, the series is a ministry fueled by prayer prayer powered ministry. And so we started uh, this series and we started talking about um, how the Holy Ghost was brought in through the upper room and the preparation that took place and how this community of believers uh, had the characteristics of Christians and they had to petition God for holy boldness. And then they had uh, challenges in their growing ministry. And we learned how we have to make the adjustment in order that we may fulfill God's will sometimes in our life uh, as we grow. We encounter different obstacles, different trials, different tribulations, but we don't 
uh, succumb to those things, we yet hold on and make the adjustments uh, so that God can get the glory out of what we're doing and out of how um, we are uh, conducting ourselves as it relates to God. And one of the other things uh, that we're going to talk about tonight is once we start being a ministry, an individual, a person, a business, a church that is fueled by prayer, we now have to be prepared that we are going to encounter some enemies. Everybody is not going to be excited about the growth, the development, and the new thing that God is doing in us. Everybody is not going to be excited about what's taking place. But yet, even in the midst of that, God has called us as believers uh, to pray for our enemies and to uh, lift up a standard and a banner of holiness uh, that they will see Jesus Christ inside of us. Our base scripture tonight is going to come from Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, um, and we will look at uh, verses 54 through 60. Acts chapter 7, verses uh, 54 through 60. Again, for those who are taking notes or following along with us, Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. Right, and the word of the Lord declares, and I'm going to read from the uh, King James Version. When they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he said, being full of the Holy Ghost, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Prayers for our enemies. Prayers for our enemies or praying for our enemies. Again, looking at a ministry, a person, an individual who is fueled by prayer. And one of the first things we must understand uh, when we are a person that is fueled by prayer, prayer is the, the driving force behind what we do. We are going to experience some challenges. Growth is going to come. All right. You're going to need boldness to continue to decree and declare what God has given you to do, to do in the earth. And um, you're going to have challenges and challenges, growth challenges. But then another challenge that you have is that you're going to have enemies. But what do we do for our enemies? We don't fight them. We don't beat them. We don't destroy them, but we pray for our enemies. After introducing us to the first seven deacons uh, ordained in the Jerusalem church, the acts of the apostles shifts the narrative to starting to talk about Deacon Stephen. He is commended for being full of faith and power and is credited for performing with performing signs and wonders, a deacon, a deacon, a deacon, right? Um, the, uh, this indicates that Stephen effectively and eventually became an evangelist. His miracles and teaching won converts to Christ, particularly from among the Hellenistic, the Greek speaking Jews in Jerusalem. And we talked about them the last time that we uh, met on this subject. At the time, they were immigrant communities living in their own neighborhoods throughout the city, and they had established their own synagogues. The leaders of those synagogues began to view Stephen as a threat. So they stirred up the authorities to apprehend and try him for blasphemy. Again, when you start being a person that is fueled by prayer and you're moving forward and doing God's will for your life, get ready. Not only are you going to experience these challenges internally, you're going to experience, experience challenges externally. But again, it's not the challenges that you experience. It's how you respond to them. 
Stephen preached a long sermon as his defense before the Sanhedrin Council, and in it he, refers, he rehearsed the history of the Jewish nation, of which the culmination was Jesus the Christ. Jesus was the prophet that Moses had foreseen coming. The tabernacle also metaphorically pointed to Christ. Yet while making this case, Stephen was apparently interrupted by complaints or heckling. So he shifted into a rebuke of the audience. And he said in verse 51, ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. And the mood in the building got ugly. When you start standing up and taking your rightful place, and moving forward and doing the things that God is giving you to do, it is not going to always be easy. It is not going to always be filled with good things and good times and happy and, and just going forth. And good. You're going to encounter some difficulties. You're going to have some enemies, but you have been equipped by God to be bold to stand against the enemies of Jesus Christ. The first thing we need to look at in praying for our enemies is that the provocation to anger and great defense. Stephen's words sawed apart, the literal meaning of the Greek phrase in verse 54, the hearts of the hearers, all right? Again, verse 54 tells us when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth. Stephen had just, as I said uh, earlier, had just finished his defense against the false accusations that he had blasphemed against the Mosaic, Mosaic law and that Mo, and wished that Moses would have destroyed the temple. So the reference here to the Jews, the Cyrene, meaning Libya, Alexandria, Egypt, and the provinces of Sicilia and Asia in modern day Asia Minor, as well as Jews descended from freed slaves who apparently were living here. Uh, which were known as the Hellenistic Jews. It is very possible that many members of his audience knew little about Jesus as Jews dwelling outside Judea didn't make it to Jerusalem for all the required feasts. The men from Northern Africa and Asia Minor have made a significant time and financial commitment to their homeland. And the members of the Freedmen Synagogue may be especially reverent since if their first free generation, they would be the first generation allowed to worship in the temple. The message that a man know little about is the son of God is not something they can accept. So they begin to gnash their teeth. And this is a sign of an imminent attack. The Jews who came to worship at Pentecost seven weeks after the crucifixion had a better reaction. When Peter preached to them, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? God's plan was always that once Jerusalem was sufficiently saturated with the gospel, that Jesus' followers would spread throughout Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And he's about to use persecution to do this. Again, God will use your struggle. He will use your difficulty. He will use your sickness. He will use your lack. He will use Anything that you consider to be negative in your life, what you consider to be negative, he uses it as a part of his plan to reach the destiny that he has for your life and the body of Christ. They believe that they spoke with Moses' authority, but the deacon applied a term of derision uh, towards them that Moses made famous. They prided themselves on keeping the covenant, but Stephen said they were actually uncircumcised in their hearts. Physically, they may have been circumcised. Physically, they may have uh, 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 followed the law and done the things that were necessary, but their hearts were far from it. He even accused the Israelites of having always rebelled against God's true representatives. And his reproach sparked such a raving anger in the audience that the listeners gnashed on him with their teeth. They were snarling like mad dogs. They were now ready to bite and devour him. And things got worse. Empowered now by the Holy Ghost to bear his imminent martyrdom, Stephen was swept in, up in a vision. Fixing his gaze upward, he reported that he could see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This vision affirmed that Christ was aware of the situation and had regard for their faithfulness of his servant. But when Stephen shared the vision, he exasperated the Jewish leader, leaders. His report of what was being revealed to him was the last straw. So these individuals are already upset. 
verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He saw something as they were snarling at him, as they were getting upset with him, as they were uh, 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 getting mad because he called them out. See, when you call people out on their sin, when you call the world out on what they're doing wrong, when you call people out, your family members, your friends, everybody's not going to like it. Some of them are going to snarl. They're going to they, 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 they're, they're going to snarl like a mad dog. They're going to gnash their teeth. They're going to get angry because you're messing with their lifestyle. You're, 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 you're telling them that what they've been doing is not working. And as you a person that's fueled by prayer, as you go forth in prayer and begin to lift up your countenance in prayer, begin to seek God in prayer, God will position, position you in places to speak out against the evils of this world to speak out against the things that are going wrong. And everybody's not going to like it. So Stephen was facing a furious mob bent on murder, but his attention was on Jesus. There is a difference between being notably full of the Holy Spirit and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every believer should permanently uh, indwell, be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Being truly filled with the Holy Spirit means a total yielding of our thoughts and actions. Given our fallible human nature, this feeling of the Holy Spirit doesn't usually last, but is a normal state for Stephen. Stephen is so engulfed in God, so engulfed in the work of God, so engulfed in doing the work that God has called him to do, that he has now become filled with the Spirit as these individuals are ready to snarl at him, as these individuals are ready to devour him. And one of the crimes that Stephen is accused of is that he is continuing Jesus' plan to destroy the temple. The charge is ridiculous, it's erroneous, since the Sanhedrin knew Jesus was talking about his own body and not an actual temple. The greater irony, however, is that Jesus was really crucified because he prophesied what Stephen is seeing. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. It was those words that gave the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes justification in their own minds to take Jesus to Pilate in Mark 14. There is a slight difference here, however. Jesus said he will sit at the right hand of God, but Stephen sees him standing. To stand in someone's presence is to offer someone's, is to offer one's service. It seems that Jesus is letting Stephen know that he is there for him. See, when you stand up for Jesus, when you're a person that's fueled by prayer and you're doing the will of God, when your enemies rise up against you, Jesus stands up. My God, we used to sing the song, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. When Jesus stands up, Understand, he's not standing up because he's getting ready to go to the bathroom. He's not standing up because he's getting ready to go cook a, a sandwich, make a sandwich or cook some chicken. He's standing up to let you know I'm here for you. I'm getting ready to fight for you. I'm getting ready to defend you. I'm getting ready to come to your beck and call because I am Jehovah Shama. Good God Almighty. The Lord God that's present with you. Hallelujah. So a person, a ministry that's fueled by prayer, you're going to encounter enemies. But when your enemies rise up, Jesus says, don't worry. I'm going to stand up too. When your enemies come up against you, don't worry. Don't get bent out of shape. I'm getting ready to stand up too. So arise from your rest. He'll get up and stand at attention for his people. Now we see the prayers of submission and forgiveness. Convinced that they were now witnesses of Stephen's blasphemy, his judges pronounced sentence and, pre and prepared to exact punishment. The deacon and evangelist was dragged from before the Sanhedrin to a location outside of the city. And a group of the witnesses became executioners as sanctioned by the law. They took off their outer garments, picked up stones, and began to throw and pummel the deacon. They began to stone him. They began to come against him. They cover their ears and yelling to the top of their voice, they rushed to him. These people were angry. They couldn't refute his arguments that Jesus of Nazareth was a Messiah. They were furious when he defended himself using Jewish history to show how hypocritical they were. But now Stephen has claimed to see Jesus, the man who was crucified, standing at the right hand of God. They cannot allow this to go unchallenged. One of the false accusations Stephen is charged with is that he will change the customs that Moses delivered to the Jews. 
Stephen's defense pointed out that the Jews were never good at following the Mosaic law anyway. They much preferred worshiping foreign gods. So Stephen's accusers are now stopping their ears. They don't want to hear what he is saying. And God is, God is accusing the Jews of purposely ignoring parts of the law aimed at protecting the vulnerable. But God also says they made their hearts diamond heart lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of the hosts, the words of the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. God responds to such resistance by allowing it to continue. Make the heart of the people dull and their ears heavy and their blinds, they're blind and blind their eyes, as Isaiah said, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. The last part of Stephen's defense is that the Jews would rather murder God's prophets than to listen to him. A conviction also held by Jews, by Jesus, Stephen's accusers are about to prove his point. Do not be surprised. As you are a person that engulfs yourself in prayer and you begin to go forth and do the will of the father, some people are going to shut their ears up to you. I thought about a little child when they don't want to hear, they stick their fingers in their ears and say, la, 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 la. They don't want to hear what you're saying. They don't want to take heed to your instruction. They don't want to take heed to your advice. And God said, you know what? In Isaiah 6 and 10, fine. They don't want to hear, make their heart dull, make their ears heavy and blind their eyes. And if you do this, they will not turn and be healed. Everybody's not going to accept what God is doing in your life. Everybody's not going to be glad about the deliverance that's taking place. Everybody's not going to be excited about the elevation that God is allowing to go forth in your life. Everybody's not glad about your purpose and your destiny being reached. But yet in the midst of this, Jesus stands up and lets Stephen know in the midst of these people dragging you and, and, and being upset with you, as he said in verse 58, drag him out of the city and begin to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Jesus said, I'm going to stand up for you. Yeah. I'm so glad to know tonight that if I do have enemies that rise up against me, Jesus is going to stand up for me. Stephen was bold to declare to the Israelites, you ain't got the real thing. As a matter of fact, you never had it and you're hard in accepting it now. Your hearts are uncircumcised. A Jewish Christian and deacon, Stephen, has angered the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem by showing that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. His arguments were so unimpeachable that the men resorted to falsely accusing him of blasphemy. See, when you're going forth in the will of God and doing the work of God, even if people can't find anything wrong with what you're doing, they'll make up stuff because they don't want to see God's will perfected in your life. They don't want to see you go forth because the world does not love Jesus. They hate the gospel. They hate the message of Jesus Christ. Demons and devils are upset. That's why Satan is, that's why Satan is glad. Bless you, distribution there. Satan is glad when he sees us quiet, when he sees us refusing to say anything, when he sees us chilling and cooling and acting like the world is not in the condition that it is. He's glad about that. But when we stand up and begin to recite the scriptures, begin to decree, decree and declare the word of God, begin to take a stand against the evils of this world. He gets mad. I got mad as a dog who's snarling and ready to bite and devour his prey. He's mad. The anger of these people has been kindled up because of Stephen's bold declaration to decree and declare to them that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not only that, that they don't have him like they need to have him. See? You can't be afraid to tell people. I love you, but that ain't right. You, you can't be afraid. See, because again, when you stand up for God, Jesus is going to stand up for you. And when he stands up, every one of your enemies have got to scatter. The specifics here are hard to determine, but it is believed that under Roman law, the Jews were not allowed to execute someone unless they threatened a religious structure which was a capital offense anywhere, according to John 18 and 31. The Sanhedrin was unable to convincingly convict Jesus of a charge, so they couldn't kill him outright. Plus, Jesus was so popular, they want his blood. They did not want his blood on his hands, so that's why they took him to Pilate, knowing that if the Roman government killed this teacher from Galilee, the attention would be off of them. So why does the mob feel free to kill Stephen? 
Although he had been performing miracles and signs and wonders, he was still relatively unknown. He certainly isn't the leader of this movement, so he had no crowd of defenders, and his accusers are angry beyond reason. Not only that, he has successfully shown that the Jews are God's people without the law or the temple. He has claimed that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. And if Stephen is speaking falsely, this is the grossest blasphemy possible to say that a man shares God's glory. And because they rejected Stephen's message of the gospel, the accusers cannot accept Stephen might be telling the truth. Although their execution of Stephen is against the Roman law, and although Stephen hasn't really officially been convicted of anything wrong, and the charges brought against him are false, the mob is at least performing the execution according to the Mosaic law. According to Leviticus, Leviticus 24, 10 through 23, if someone blasphemes against God, they should be taken out outside the city limits and the witnesses should stone them. Jesus prophesied what was happening to Stephen. He told the disciples that the world would treat them the same way they treated him. Jesus was almost stoned twice in John chapter 8 and chapter 10 and was executed for the same reason as Stephen, for claiming himself as God. Let me tell you something, saints of God. Being fueled by prayer does not mean that you're going to zoom through this life easy. Being fueled by prayer doesn't mean that every day is going to be sunshine and you're going to get everything you want and everybody's going to love you and everybody's going to adore you and everybody's going to flock to you. Being a person fueled by prayer, being a church fueled by prayer, being a ministry fueled by prayer, being a family fueled by prayer, you're going to attract enemies naturally. Because people don't, for whatever reason, Every other religion can do whatever they want. Every other sect can do whatever they want. Every other group can do whatever they want. But when the saints stand up and begin to declare the truth of God's word, it ruffles feathers and people get upset. Jesus prepared his disciples. Everybody's not going to receive your message. Everybody's not going to be glad for your elevation. Everybody's not going to be glad for the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. But you got to stand up. Jesus did not tell his disciples about the young man who stands with the mob's coat at Stephen's feet. He is a Jew, a Jew who grew up in Tarsus on the south facing eastern coast of modern day Asia Minor. He has been trained by one of the revered Pharisees and there is no one more zealous for the law. Soon he will persecute the Christians in Jerusalem and when they flee, he will get permission to chase them even to Damascus, almost 200 miles away and there on the Damascus road. Saul will meet Jesus. And after years of growth, he will start to use the Greek version of his name, Paul, to become a missionary to the Gentiles. See? And see, because of the way that we are in this world, we have been, for whatever reason, the body of Christ silenced. We have stopped being bold in proclaiming who we are because we've stopped praying and seeking God like we should. If you pray, and you seek God, you're going to receive threats and you're going to have to get some boldness. Growth is going to be inevitable. Inevitable. You're going to have to make some adjustments. And guess what? Some enemies are going to rise up against you and you're going to have to pray for them. Stephen didn't back down. Stephen didn't shut up. Stephen didn't change his mind. Stephen did not renege on his confession. He stood flat foot on what he declared. You all are wrong. Jesus is the Christ, and you would do better to serve him than to serve this fictitious man-made stuff that you're making up based on the law. Jesus came to destroy the law. Matter of fact, the law was fulfilled in him. But when you got people who are committed to misunderstanding the gospel, you cannot back down because of their misunderstanding. You can't back down. And while they were stoning him, verse 59, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen understood the sacrifice, glory to God, that he had made in making these Jews mad. He understood the sacrifice, my God, that he had made in standing up and telling them that they were wrong. And he said, if this is the price I have to pay, Sister Tasha, for my Lord, then stone me. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We see the refuge of prayer in these final moments of Stephen's life. He modeled his words after those his master had spoken on the cross. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit is an echo of Jesus saying, Father, 
into thy hands. Glory to God. I commend my spirit. Lay not sin to their charges. A restatement of father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The former is a prayer to replicate the submission of Jesus. The latter is a prayer to imitate the Lord's selfless concern for sin sick humanity. In the furnace of suffering and sacrifice, Stephen forged Christ's likeness in his soul. I don't know when it's going to happen, but trust and believe you're going to have to give an account of your belief. And you can't back down. You cannot back down from your belief. You have got to stand tall and firm on what you believe in. The process of stoning is more involved than simply throwing rocks. According to the Mishnah Sanhedrin, the officials take the person out of the court, ask for defensive testimony, then ask the person to acknowledge their crime and deserve and that they deserve the punishment that is coming to them. The convict is thrown into a lower area off a cliff twice the height of the man so that he falls face up. If he lands face down, he is flipped over. If he dies from the fall, the execution is over. If he does not die from the fall, a witness slams a large stone into his heart. If this doesn't kill him, the crowd throws stones on him until he is dead. So it is likely Stephen is saying these words that they were walking him to the place of stoning. Glory to God. Not while they are throwing rocks at him. While they were walking him to stone him. While they were walking him to kill him while they were walking him to the place of execution while they were walking him to the altar of sacrifice he was praying lord receive my spirit he was praying lord forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing don't hold this sin to the charge saints of god as we are ridiculed as we are persecuted as we are mocked upon for our salvation can we look on those who are against us and say lord don't lay this sin, glory to God, hallelujah, to their charge. It's not known how long Stephen has been in Jerusalem or if he was present at Jesus' crucifixion, but he surely heard the stories. And so he knows that as Jesus breathed his last breath, my God, as painful as the circumstances are, he had a full assurance that Jesus was waiting for him. He didn't fear dying because he knew where he was going. Are you saying to me, Pastor Ryan, I need to get ready to die? No, but what I am saying to you is that you need to be ready to defend the gospel. What I am saying to you is that as you move forward in your purpose, as you begin to pray as never before, as you begin to fast, go to Bashete, get to the Moshe, and call on the name of the Lord, get ready, the devil's about to get mad. See, as long as you are lazy, as long as you are lackadaisical, as long as you are unconcerned, as long as you are careless, as long as you're just attending church but not involved, he's okay. But when he sees you laying hold of your salvation, when he sees you begin to stand up against the evils of our world, my God, when he begins to see you not back down, hallelujah, from what's going on, it gets him mad. He's upset. He want to stop you. He want to destroy you. He want to bring you to the place, my God, where you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But if you know that God is with you, you can say like David said, yea, though I walk, glory to God, through the valley, hallelujah, of the shadow of death. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'll, oh, God, thank you. I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. How is it that Stephen could be marched from the court to outside the city limits, knowing what's about to happen to him. And he not renege on his confession. He not draw back on his statement. He not say, I take it back. How is it that he could do this? Glory to God, because he knew that Jesus was with him. Hallelujah. My God might be ostracized, might be criticized, might be minimized, might be laughed at, might be looked over unappreciated. My God, but I won't back down. Huh? I said, I won't back down because I know the Lord is with me. None of us today will see Jesus on earth. We hope to see him when next to God as the skies open up at the rapture. But if we trust Jesus' sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins, and if we have willingly accepted him as Lord and Savior, we can have the same ending as Stephen. Our soul is in Christ's hand where we will never be taken away. I'm free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. If I lose all my friends, no longer bound. 
No more chains holding me if my family turned their back on me. My soul, glory to God, is resting. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, if I have to walk alone, it's just a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. Stephen stood the test and prayed for his enemies. See, sometimes when we feel, find out that enemies are rising up against us, we back down. But let me hush. Well, let me be quiet. No, you need to cry even the more. For the Bible declares, cry loud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Show my people their transgressions. Let the world know the wages of sin is still death. Glory, but the gift of God. Hallelujah. It is, glory to God, eternal life. Stand up against the evils of this world. Hallelujah. When men are calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. When men are saying you can get by with a little this and a little bit of that. When men are saying do what you want to do and have a good time, decree and declare, no! God's word says thus and so. Let them know. I understand what you're saying, but you're wrong. That's not my God. Let them know. I understand what you're saying, but no. That's not right. That's not my God. And if they march you to the place of stoning, if they crucify you on the cross of persecution, if they lie on you, if they talk about you, pray for them. Tell them like Stephen told the Lord, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. They, they, they have a misunderstanding of the gospel. They are, they are misconstrued with the scriptures. They, they've been perplexed and confused by what you meant in your word. So don't hold this against their charge. Stephen could have said, Lord, as soon as they kill me, you kill them. But Stephen prayed that God would spare them so they could hear the message. Good thing he did because Saul was in that group. Good thing he told God, don't hold this sin to their charge because Saul was in that group. Had Saul, had the charge of this been laid to Saul, perhaps the, 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 the rest of the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament would have never been written. Perhaps the door for Gentile believers would have never been open. Sometimes God is using your circumstance to let your enemies know that he's real. Stephen said, don't do it, God. Don't, 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 don't lay charge to them what they're doing. And then Stephen was stoned and he died. He echoes the sentiments. It's not exactly clear what effect this has on God's interaction with Stephen's murderers. Doesn't mean that they are saved because salvation only comes through faith in Jesus. But Stephen at least died with no feelings of ill will. Now, you know, his prayer didn't automatically mean salvation for them. But Stephen died with a pure conscience. See, when you lay down at night, I don't care who has risen up against you. I don't care who's talked about you, who's lied on you. When you lay down at night, you want to lay down in peace. You, wanna, you don't want to lay down in contention. You don't want to lay down in worryation because you haven't handled things like you should have. You want to lay down in peace. And Stephen died. The Bible declares he fell asleep, which is a euphemism for dying. It reflects the fact that for the believer, death is not permanent. We will rise again, receive new bodies, and live for eternity with God. That's why Stephen basically said, as Paul would write in a few books over, for me to die is Christ. For me to live is gain. Stephen knew that if this is the sacrifice I've got to make, that the door will be open for others to receive the truth of Christ's message and the truth of God's word, then so be it. His death was a tragedy and a, and a crime. And what happens next is even more so. Saul, the young man watching the mob's coats, will do everything in his power to destroy the church. He will arrest believers. He will try to get them to blaspheme. He will vote for their executions. But God works good out of Saul's sadism. As the Christians flee Jerusalem, they take the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Philip goes north to Samaria where a group of non-Jews accept Christ. Then south where an Ethiopian court official is saved. Some of the believers in Jerusalem are from Cyprus and Cyrene. 
These second generation Jesus followers take the gospel to Antioch, which is near Turkey and Antakya today, where Barnabas will find a thriving church. After Saul meets Jesus on the Damascus road and repents for his sins against the church in Christ, he will meet Barnabas in, in Antioch where they will make their headquarters. And it is Antioch where Jesus' followers are first called Christians. Stephen's death is an illustration of a cryptic comment Paul will make several years later. He wrote to the church at Colossae, Colossians 1 and 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that he is, the church. There is nothing we can do or experience that will add to Jesus' sacrifice, for his sacrifice was fully sufficient for our salvation. Paul was simply saying that suffering is necessary sometimes to spread the gospel. We must remember that as we suffer, whether with slight ridicule or even with martyr, or even as a martyr, Jesus told his disciples that the world would hate him and that they would hate his followers. But God would redeem the hate we experience and use it for something good. A ministry fueled by prayer must be prepared. The enemies will rise up. There will be people that will come in our congregation and will ridicule our message. There will be those who will laugh at our Pentecostal expression of praise and worship. There will be those who will mock our speaking in tongues. There will be those who will laugh at our devotion, dedication, and commitment to the will of the Father and to the message of Jesus Christ and to the church of the living God. But don't be weary. Don't be upset. God says, I'll use even that and turn it for my good. Had Stephen not been a martyr in that moment, perhaps Saul would have never witnessed what he saw and been on the Damascus road and be led to Christ. So understand that you're going to receive, you're going to have enemies. And it takes a considerable degree of grace to respond well to persecution. There is always a temptation to hurl imprecatory prayers at our tormentors. But Stephen left us an example. <laughs> Stephen left us an example and precatory prayers are prayers that invoke evil. You know, when somebody hurts us, we want to say, Lord, get them back. Lord, make them feel what they made me, make them feel how they made me feel. Let them go through what I had to go through. Let them endure. But no, 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 no. Stephen says that's not the way. It is not given to every believer to die for the faith. However, a saint's life will have many opportunities to experience and exhibit the spirit of a martyr and to be magnanimous in our adversities and magnanimous to our adversaries. No, all of us are not going to die for the faith, but the spirit of martyr where you're ridiculed, you're gnarled and snarled at it, teeth are gnashed at you because you declare the gospel. People are going to get upset because you don't want to bow and bend to the things of this world. People are not going to like you. They're going to say, oh, you think you're better than us. Oh, God. They're going to say, oh, you're holier than thou. Oh, you think you're better than us. Oh, you think you're greater than us. Oh, you think you're perfect. Oh, you think you're this and you think you're that. But we must remember the command of Christ in Matthew 5 and 44 to pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Those who rise up against the church, we pray for them. Oh, God, touch their heart. Father, for they don't even know what they're saying against your manservant. They don't even know what they're saying against, the, against your woman servant, against your handmaiden. God, cover them. God, trouble them. God, bring them in before it's too late. Stephen didn't say, God, I hope you kill them after they kill me. But Stephen said, Lord, don't even lay this sin to their charge. Because perhaps somewhere down the road, the gospel will be preached again to them and they'll be in a different position and they will receive it. We know the context of the passage wasn't just to pray about them. Jesus wants us to love our enemies, bless them and do good for them. This is how we reflect our father in heaven. He is generous and patient with his enemies. He sacrificed his life, the life of his only begotten son to reconcile with his enemies. And if we are in his image and after his likeness, we should emulate God in this grace as well. Let me tell you something. As you go forth in 
prayer. As you inundate yourself in the will of God and in the plan and purpose of God, the enemy is going to rise up. He may rise up in your family. He may rise up in your uh, community. He may rise up at your job. But we must pray for the strength to sincerely forgive those who speak evil and do evil against us. We must pray to remember that the saints will suffer Christ, suffer, suffer persecution for Christ's sake. And we must pray for the salvation of all those who behave unkindly because they don't know our living Savior. We have a job to do, saints of God. God has called us to be lights in darkness. And it's not easy. But yet God has commissioned us as his believers to pray for our enemies. When you start getting into that prayer life and you really start going into the deep recesses of God and begin to learn the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of God's word and become one with God and really get devoted and committed and dedicated to your relationship with God. The devil's upset. He's already upset that you're saved. But now what he's trying to do is stagnate you. But when you develop, look at all the biblical examples. Every person in the Bible that developed a close relationship with God, what did the devil do? He tried to sever it. Job was a man that eschewed evil. He didn't even do no wrong. The devil tried to wipe him out. When you're ridiculed, when you're criticized, pray for those. Allow the prayer that brought you to this place where you now have a boldness and you're now adjusting to the challenges of growth that are taking place, which is a good thing. And now your enemies are rising up against you and they're falsely accusing you and saying this and saying all manner of evil against you falsely for the Lord's sake. The Bible says rejoice, get glad about it, get excited about it, because great is your reward in heaven. As you suffer for Christ's sake, know that Jesus is standing up as Stephen saw him in his vision, as he was being marched to the outside city limits to receive this stoning and this whipping and this beating and this, oh my God, un, uh, uh, un, un, unusual and, 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 and distasteful and, and evil punishment that he did not even deserve. He was full of the Holy Spirit. You got to be full of the Holy Spirit. You got to be full of the Holy Spirit that you may be able to withstand. Don't draw back. Don't renege. Don't take it back. But before you take it back, add more to it. I pray you've been blessed tonight. Somebody tonight has been trying to figure out, thank you, Holy Ghost, why am I being bombarded with so much? The enemy has risen up against you because he sees the growth in your spiritual life and he is mad. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Somebody is wondering tonight, why am I being bombarded with so many? If it ain't this, it's that. If it ain't that, it's the other. If it ain't the other, it's all three. What is going on? I'm doing all I know to do. I'm saying all I know to say. I'm living holy. I'm paying tithe. I'm paying offering. I'm attending church. I'm being faithful. I'm praying. I'm reading my word. That's what's it. That's what's it. The enemy is mad because he sees the growth, Sister Tasha that you're making, as Bishop Willard would say, the splendid strides that you're making, and he's upset, and he want to stop you. He wanted Stephen to renounce everything that he said. But instead, Stephen said, I refuse to take it back. I made a vow to the Lord, and I won't get back. I made a vow to the Lord, and I won't take it back. It was a holy vow, and I won't take it back. It was a holy vow, and I won't take it back. Don't take it back. Ah, hey, God, thank you. Don't take it back. I need somebody on this Facebook Live to type, don't take it back. I need somebody on the conference call line to decree and declare, don't take it back. Don't take it back. Let me get up here and type mine too. My God, don't take it back. 
Stephen did not take back anything that he said. As the young folks say today, he stood 10 toes down on what he said. And he was right. He was falsely accused for it, but he was right. It cost him his life. But for me to live, for me to die is Christ. It cost him his life, but look where he ended up being. In paradise. So don't take it back. Don't take back your confession of faith. Don't take back what you said. According to God's word. Don't take back. The promises that you made God. That you were going to do this and do that. Don't take it back. The enemy is just mad. But pray for your enemies. Those that the devil's using to rise up against you. Go down in prayer for them. And start rejoicing. The more they talk, the louder you shout. The more they come against you, the harder you dance. The more they rise up against you, the longer you stay down in prayer, the more fervor you have. Because I'm not taking it back. Before I take it back, I'll add more to it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you tonight, Father. I thank you tonight, Father, that you've given us the grace to understand, God, that as we become individuals, a ministry, a people that is fueled by prayer, that not only, Father, will we need boldness to declare your word and to stand tall, and not only, Father, will we experience challenges, but, God, you'll help us to make the make the adjustment in those challenges. Not only will we experience challenges of growth, Father, but you'll help us to make the adjustment in those growth challenges. But, Father, you've given us to understand tonight that our enemies, the devil, will rise up against us in various forms, through people, through places, through things, through ideas. God, but give us the strength to sincerely forgive those who speak evil against us, those who are laughing at us, those who are criticizing us. Help us not to dummy down to their level. Help us not to go low where they are and respond as they respond, but help us, Father, to do as you did on that cross for all of us. You said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And you said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh God, help us to remember that as saints, Father, we will suffer persecution. We will suffer, oh God, ungodly treatment sometimes because we name your name. But oh God, you made us a covenant promise. You never leave us, you never forsake us. You go with us, you stand by us, no matter what we deal with, no matter what we contend with, no matter what we're faced with, Father. So help us to remember, Father, that as we suffer for your sake, you are Jehovah Shama. you are ever present. Help, God, and when the spirit of the enemy, glory to God, rises up against us. Oh, God, you'll lift up a banner against the enemy. Father, we pray even now, God, for salvation of the world. Those who speak against the church, those who speak against the believers, those who speak against the body of Christ. Father, we pray for salvation, that you would save them. Our loved ones, our friends, God, those who have turned their back on us because we no longer want to do the things of this world. Father, save them. Put a desire in their heart, their mind, and soul, Father, to seek you like they've never sought you before. That they too may come running saying, what must I do to be saved? Thank you for the strength to endure, Father. Yeah, thank you for, oh, yeah, Damashe. Thank you for the strength to endure tonight, Father, to keep persevering, to keep pressing. As we may be marched to the place of stoning, to the place of ridicule, Father, we decree and declare tonight we will not take, take it back. We will not bend, we will not break, we will not bow, we will not renege on our confession, but we will stand bold on the declaration that you are Lord. And whatever comes or goes, come hell or high water, we're determined to walk with you all the way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. He has done great things whereof we are exceedingly glad. Won't you help us tonight? The word of God has been a blessing to you. Come on and sow that $10 seed tonight. And come on when you sow it. Come on, put in the comments. This is my I'm not taking it back seed. Yeah, this is my. And if you don't have 10, whatever you have, sow something in this word tonight. This is my I'm not taking it back seed. I'm not going to go back and revert back to the world. I'm not going to go back and undo but let me change it. I'm not going to say that anymore. No, I'm going to stand, as the young folks say, 10 toes down on what I see it. If it's sin, it's sin. If it's righteousness, it's righteousness. So sow that seed tonight. You can sow via Cash App, via Tithely, via PayPal, 
via Givelify, or you can mail it in. The ways to give are on the screen. The saints that are on the conference call, I know you know how to give. Please sow that seed tonight. Amen. That $10 seed. If you don't have 10, sow the closest thing to it that you can sow. Five, four, seven, whatever that seed is on tonight. Sow it, sow it, sow it, sow it, sow it. Yes. Thank you, First Lady. First Lady said, I'm sowing my $20. This is my I'm not taking it back seed. Yes. Bless you, Sister Sylvia. I'm not taking it back. I'm not. I'm not. I know what the world is doing. I know what the world is saying, but I'm fueled by prayer and I can't take it back. I believe God's word. I know what the economy is saying. I know what the world is saying, but I believe God. So come on and sow that seed tonight right where you are. And I know that the Lord is going to bless you for your seed sowing on tonight. Just a couple of announcements and we're going to be off in just a moment. We do from 730 to 830. We started uh, at 7.35, so just give us a few more moments on tonight. I love it. The saints are commenting, I won't take it back. I, ref I refuse. I refuse to take it back. Before I take it back, I'll add more to it. Tomorrow night, don't forget, please, saints of God and those who are watching, you are welcome to come and join us as we travel to Snow Hill Missionary Baptist Church, 7171 Highway 94 in Fairfield, North Carolina, to be with Pastor Antonio Brown and their family and friends weekend. And we'll be sharing tomorrow night at seven o'clock p.m. Come on and go with us. Come on and share with us in the service. There is a word from the Lord and a move of the Holy Ghost that I believe you need to experience. If you're not busy, come on and help us. Come on and travel with us and help us to spread this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, on Sunday morning, we'll be back at our sanctuary um, 705 Washington Street, Williamston, North Carolina at the E.J. Hayes building on the west end or the north side, Liberty Worship Center. Our Sunday morning worship will begin at 10 a.m. If you can't be in person, you can watch on the same page you're watching on tonight. Sunday morning, the Lord's given us a word that kind of coincides with this that we're going to look at for the remainder of this month. So come on and share with us in these services. And then on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock p.m., we are so excited to celebrate appreciate and uh, encourage, amen, the wife of our former first lady, I'm not sorry, the wife, yeah, the wife of our former pastor, I'm sorry, evangelist missionary, Alice Williams, and a legacy celebration, uh, our own jurisdictional first lady, Lady Sheila Willard will be our guest speaker, and we're looking forward to having a high time in the Lord. You want to be there as we encourage this woman of God who has stayed in the ministry. She did not leave but she stayed here because the Lord told her to, and it's been such a blessing. And we just want to honor her for 15 years of faithful, dedicated, and committed service to the work of the ministry and her late husband, just to show her some love. Even though the changing of guards have taken place and things are different, we want to let her know that her church family still loves her. And if she's been a blessing to you in your life and your family's life, come on and share with us on Sunday at three o'clock as we encourage her heart to let her know that even though the Lord has called Pastor Williams home, there is still a work for her to do. She is still needed. She is still loved and she is still appreciated. So come on and help us do that on Sunday at three o'clock p.m. God bless you all. Thank you so much for sharing with us. If you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to us and we'll be so glad to answer any of those questions. Thank you all saints who have been on tonight. Remember, don't take it back. Pray for your enemies. Those who rise up against you understand it is, attack of, it is an attack of Satan to make you turn your back. They accuse Stephen of blasphemy. Here he is preaching the gospel. They accuse him of blasphemy, but he didn't take it back. Don't take it back. Stand 10 toes down on what God said and know that in the end, God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, will stand up for you. God bless you. We love you. May the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us. Henceforth, now and forevermore, have a good night's rest. Wake up tomorrow morning with new energy and new strength. And Lord's willing, we'll see you tomorrow night in Fairfield, North Carolina at Snow Hill Missionary Baptist Church. I am Pastor Ryan, pastor of, Sa of Liberty Worship Center, Church of God in Christ, incorporated in Williamson, North Carolina. And you've been listening to our virtual midweek service. Join us again Sunday morning, 10 a.m. in Williamson, North Carolina. Uh, every Sunday is a glory experience. God bless you and we love you.